All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this evening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Thank you for that song, Josh. Great truth. I do have a question. How many of you know what an Ebenezer is? Raise your hand. Be honest. How many of you know what an Ebenezer is? I cheated. I read that in my Bible this past week. In 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 12, then Samuel took a stone, set it between Mizpe and Shen, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. It was a memorial for something that God had wrought in the life of the nation of Israel, a victory that He had given them. He had delivered them from their enemies, and it was something they set up to, to remember and be able to look back at what God had done. Isn't it great to get in the church house and open a hymnal and open a Bible and look in the mirror of God's Word and, and, and see all the things that are, that are lacking in our Christian lives, that are uh, all the areas that we have for improvement, all the ways we can become more like Jesus. But isn't it also a blessing to be able to, to look in that Bible and see some things that God has accomplished? And, 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 and some victories that, that God has wrought in our lives and some blessings that he's given us. So in Ebenezer, it's not just Scrooge. I figured everybody raised their hand. Everybody knows what an Ebenezer is. That's a real mean guy at Christmas time. First Thessalonians chapter number 4. This is our next chapter in this great New Testament book. Um, I had the opportunity to preach last May, May 2021, in a, in a Bible conference, the theme was 1 Thessalonians. The assignments were from the book of 1 Thessalonians and been in this book uh, ever since. All of God's Word is inspired of God and profitable. Helps us for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. 1 Thessalonians 4, you're likely familiar with. This is the great foundational chapter on the rapture of the church, and we find that discussed in verses 13 uh, through 18. That is the overarching theme of the epistle of First Thessalonians. Again, every chapter contains a reference to the promised return of Jesus Christ. This is the believer's blessed hope, and in First Thessalonians 4, it is presented as a very comforting truth. We sorrow not as others which have no hope. We, we have hope that Christ will come again, will be with Him forever, will be reunited with those who believe in Him and have trusted Him as Savior and will ever be with the Lord. And what comforting truths uh, those are. Just incredible and rich and powerful verses there at the end of the chapter. That won't be our focus this evening. Uh, we'll focus more on the first 12 verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and, and what these verses show is how we ought to live in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. Verses 13 through 18 reiterate the promise, and we have hope, and we have comfort in that promise, but it's a promise that though it might happen at any time, it might not happen today, so what am I supposed to do if Jesus were to come today? What am I supposed to be doing if Jesus comes tomorrow? What am I supposed to do if Jesus doesn't come for another hundred years? 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 12 answer that question. And very simply, these verses show us how we as Christians, we as saved people, can live a life that is pleasing to God. You know what really simplify the Christian life if we could really make that our desire? Because if we have a true desire to please the Lord, it is an easy thing to open the Bible and discern what it is that pleases God. If in our hearts what we want more than anything else is to fulfill the purpose for which God placed us on the earth, Revelation 4.11 and that's to please Him, it really make a lot of questions in your life easy. It really make a lot of decisions in your life easy. The things that people argue about and the things that people push back on when you try to open the Bible and preach God's Word, the problem is they're just not interested in pleasing the Lord. 
If we could approach the scripture with, with that intent, and if we could approach life with that desire, if, if that could be the way that I determine and decide what activities I participate in, what people I associate with, what type of entertainment that I take in and allow in my home, in my life, down to the very things that I put in my closet, if all of that could be based upon what pleases God, it'd sure make everything a lot easier. So it, again, it's not difficult to discern what pleases God. We just have to decide that's what, re, that, that, that's what we really want. Verses 1 through 12 of 1 Thessalonians 4 breaks down like this. Here's how we can please the Lord. Verses 1 through 8, walk in holiness. Walk in holiness. It's not only for Pentecostals. That doesn't mean long braided hair, denim skirts, and tennis shoes. It's not what holiness is. And, and holiness. <laughs> Get that boy some Jordans. Right? Holiness is not a bad thing. Amen. Holiness is not holiness is not the opposite of happiness. You can have both. In fact, one will lead to the other. Find that in First Thessalonians 4. So walk in holiness, verses 1 through 8. Walk in harmony, verses 9 through 10. And walk in honesty, verses 11 through 12. So we're in First Thessalonians 4. You will want to place a marker there. We'll be back and forth different places this evening. But let's pray, and we'll jump into verse number 1. Father, we are grateful that we are able to spend this time together around your word. Thank you, God, that we have a Bible uh, Lord, with pure and perfect words that come from you. And Lord, we're grateful for the ability to read it this evening. We are thankful for the Holy Spirit who guides us into the truth and gives us understanding. God, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to be in church with a group of people who want to hear what the Bible says. And so, Lord, would you help us as we study your word, Lord, to apply it to our lives. Help us to take an honest look in the mirror this evening. And help us allow you to sit in judgment on us as we heard this morning from the book of Micah. And pray that you'd be pleased, that you'd be honored, that you'd be glorified, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus... As ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Again, in 1 Thessalonians 2, we read of the manner of entering in that the apostles had when they came to Thessalonica and they preached the gospel. And that's exactly what they did in Acts chapter 17. And the gospel is the power of God to salvation in Romans 1.16. And so when they came and they preached the gospel... People got saved because they trusted in Jesus Christ. And in the midst of all that heathenism, in the midst of all that corruption, in the midst of all that defilement and immorality, in the midst of all that suffering and persecution and opposition, the gospel still works and a church was established. And those people who believed the gospel, the apostles then went on to instruct them and how to live the Christian life because salvation is not just a fire insurance policy. Salvation is not just a get out of hell free card. Salvation is not just a ticket that you put in your pocket and you show to Peter when you get up at the gate, I, I, you got to let me in, right? Salvation is, is not earned by the way that you live your life. But salvation is supposed to have a very dramatic impact on the way that we live. So the apostles who came and they preached the gospel, they took it a step farther. They besought the brethren. Verse number one, furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren. They, they, they besought them and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. To beseech is to entreat, to supplicate, to implore, to ask or to pray with urgency. There's some emotion behind this. There's some desire behind this. There is some righteous pressure being placed upon the believers by the words that were preached by the apostles according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 
In verse 1, the next term that's used is we exhort you. To exhort is to incite by words or advice. To animate or urge by arguments to a good deed or to any laudable conduct or course of action. To advise, to warn, to caution, to incite or to stimulate, to exertion. What we have in 1 Thessalonians 4.1 is really a, a restatement of what we read in chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. Look back there. Chapter 2 verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So once again, there was, there was an urging. There was a push. There was a, there was a drive. There was, there was this desire on the part of the men who came and preached the gospel and established the church that the Christians would go on to live a life that pleases God. And we need that in our lives. We need to come to a church where a man will open the Bible and he'll beseech us and he'll exhort us and he'll charge us and he'll put pressure on us and he'll try to entice us with sound arguments and godly reasoning. Look, we ought to be walking a way that pleases God. That's what the disciples, that's what the apostles did here in Thessalonica, verse number two. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. They did not give them commandments to keep in order to be saved. You don't get saved by keeping commandments. It's a good thing because nobody's ever kept them. There is one commandment the New Testament says you have to keep in order to be saved. It's Acts 17.30. God commanded all men everywhere to repent. There's only one commandment you can keep in order to get to heaven, in order to have your sins forgiven, in order to receive the salvation God offers. 1 John 3.23 says, And this is His commandment that we should believe on the name of of Jesus Christ. If you want to get to heaven by keeping a commandment, there is one commandment you can keep. Repent and believe the gospel. Amen. But having kept that commandment, God has a book that is full of commandments that he expects us to keep. That he wants us to keep. And what Paul did, because he was a faithful minister, what, what Timothy did because he was a, a true man of God. What, what Silas did because he had a desire to please the Lord. They exhorted and they besought and they charged God's people to keep God's commandments. They showed them what the commandments were. They, they drew the line that the believers were not supposed to cross. They set the bar that God wanted his people to reach to. So we're not saved by keeping those commandments, but we are saved because God wants us to keep them. This doesn't mean we're under law. We're under grace, Romans chapter 6 says, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean we're free from commandments. It means we're free from sin. James chapter 1, verse 25, you can write in your margin, God's word is called the perfect law of liberty. You see, Christian liberty and God's commandments, those are not mutually exclusive. Liberty doesn't mean you get to live however you want. Christian liberty means you have been set free from sin and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in a way that pleases the Lord. And that's a great blessing. Verse number one, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. We, we, we mentioned just a moment ago an Ebenezer, a memorial, looking back with gratitude at how far God has brought you since the time that you were saved. If, if, if we took turns giving testimonies, Here's what I was before I got saved. Here's what I did before Jesus met me. Here's the shape my life was in before I came to know the Savior compared to where you are now sitting in church 
clothed and in your right mind, just like that maniac of Mark chapter 5, there'd be lots of reasons to thank the Lord and praise the Lord and give glory to God for what he's done. But what 1 Thessalonians 4 says to us is don't be content with where you are right now. Ye received it of us, verse number 1, chapter 2, verse 13. When we came and we preached, you received it not as the word of men, but as the word of God. But don't think you don't need to receive any more. Don't think that because you've made some progress in the Christian life that you can just put it into neutral and coast from here. Don't think that because you have gained some victories that God has finished Uh, gaining victories in your life. The Bible says, I want you to receive more so you can abound more and please God more. We ought to be happy and content with who Jesus is and happy and content with what God's done for us and happy and content with what God's given us. But we should never come to the place where we're happy and content with our level of service to Him and our level of devotion to Him and our level of obedience to Him. Paul said in Philippians chapter number 3, I have not already attained. He said, I follow after. He said, I'm pressing toward the mark. And I'd say if Paul the Apostle had room to grow in his Christian life, how much more do we have? Room to grow in learning how to walk and to please the Lord. So, again, it's wonderful what God has done to this point. And let's look back and let's be grateful, but let's not just sit right here. Let's keep moving. Let's keep going. Let's keep growing. Let's get closer to the Lord. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to keep receiving His words. We're going to have to keep receiving His commandments. We're going to have to check our hearts and ask ourselves is pleasing God what I really want. Verse number two, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Hold your place, come to 1 John chapter number five. It's a great verse, 1 John chapter five. Great verse in reference to God's commandments. First John chapter five and verse... Number three, First John 5 and verse 3, the Bible says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. But the verse isn't finished. And His commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not grievous. Does it bother you that God has told you how He wants you to live? Do you, do you view God's commandments as a burden to be born? Do, do God, God's commandments get in the way of the way that you want to live your life? If you find God's commandments to be grievous, what the Bible says, it is very evident that you have no love for God. Because if you love the Lord, you'll understand His commandments are there for your blessing. For your benefit, it it proves when, when we keep God's commandments, it is proof of our love to God. But understand from 1 John 5, God giving us commandments is proof of his love for us. He gave us his commandments because he loves us wants us to go the best way, wants us to have the best life. He's he's got he's got an aerial view of everything happening here on the earth. He sees the end from the beginning. He understands where those decisions are going to take you and he knows the heartache and the pain and the sorrow and destruction that it all leads to. And the reason he gave you the commandment is to keep you away from all of that. They say that New Smyrna Beach is the shark capital of the world. I've never experienced that, thankfully. I've only heard that. But it's what they say. I have seen pictures. Not taken from the beach looking out at the ocean, taking from the sky looking down in the ocean. And those pictures will freak you out. Because that water is full of sharks. Understand, God is 
sitting in heaven this evening. He's not sitting next to you living in time and space with the same viewpoint and perspective that is so limited that we have. He is an eternal God who sees the end from the beginning. He knows how it's going to turn out. He knows where all those sharks are. He's trying to keep you away from the sharks. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 13, I believe it is. God said, I, I gave you all of these commandments for your good. Okay? If we would understand God's commandments are proof of his love for us, it would help us prove our love for him by just lining our lives up with what he said. So it's a really good barometer in your life for your level of love for God. What's your attitude when he tells you, no, I don't want you to do that? What's your response when he says, hey, you're not doing this, but you're supposed to be? What do we do when God uses the preacher to beseech us and exhort us and get his finger, in, his finger in our face and say, you're wrong, you're out of line, that's not right. This is what the Bible says and you need to do it. That will help us answer the question of how much we love the Lord. You know, we had some lively conversations downtown. On Friday afternoon, there were some groups there, if you're not aware, who are demonstrating in support of the right to murder other human beings and holding all their abortion signs. Pro, pro family, pro child, pro choice. It was somewhat contradictory, but at any rate, Brother Ed would stand um, across the street and he would preach. And something would be yelled in response to Brother Ed's preaching. So standing there, and I challenged the individual on, on whatever statement he was making. And you could tell they had no valid arguments to, to, to back up what it was they were there to proclaim and what it is they believed. Because as soon as anybody challenged them, the response was cussing and name calling and what they call that in debate class is ad hominem attacks. You, you, can't, you can't attack the viewpoint so you just attack the person who is, who is you know, giving that uh, viewpoint. And so it was so ironic because the individual I'm speaking to was complaining about people yelling insults and slurs which I never heard in my hour down there at the same time that he was cussing me up and down and calling me every name in the book. But the problem in, in, in our discussion, our back and forth, the problem was not the historical authenticity of the New Testament. I mean, that was the claimed problem, but, but the individual applied a completely different standard of evidence for the New Testament than any other document in history. The problem was not the... the the, the existence of a man by the name of Jesus Christ. That, that, that's what was stated to be the problem, but there was a completely different standard of evidence for Jesus' existence compared to Napoleon or Caesar or George Washington or anybody else that they supposedly had pictures of in the first century. I mean, that's how you really know somebody existed because there are pictures of them. The problem wasn't any of those things. The problem is not a lack of proof or evidence or arguments for the existence of God or the person of Christ or the fact of the resurrection. When you witness, you understand this, the problem with those people who are rejecting God is not that there's nothing that points to the reality of God Almighty. The problem is they don't want a God who can tell them what to do. They, they're rejecting a God because he said, no, you can't murder that child. They're rejecting a God because he said, no, you shouldn't be sleeping around with people you're not married to. The, the philosophy is not dictated by logic or by reasoning. The philosophy is dictated by lifestyle. God's commandments, there, there was a huge problem in the conversation with a God who would tell anyone what to do. The man had a little baby. I said, have you ever told your son or do you ever plan to tell your son what to do? And so he just cussed me again. 
Jesus Christ was was he didn't want to go to the cross. I concede that point. There was part of him that said, Father, if thou be willing, let this cup pass for me. The fact that he went to the cross means that he was forced and abused. I mean, this is the level of intelligence that we're dealing with. I asked the man if he ever went to school. I said, did you always want to go to school? I said, was it abuse that you had to go to school? Now, we could make an argument. Maybe it was. (laughs) But what's the point? If we love the Lord, His commandments are no big deal. If we love the Lord, we receive His commandments with gratitude. If we love the Lord, His commandments are a lamp and a light to show us where the best path through life is. Verse number 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 3, the Bible says, For this is the will of God. Oh, that's a big phrase in the Bible. The will of God. Ephesians 1, 9 commands us to know the will of God. Ephesians 5, 17 commands us to understand the will of God. Ephesians 6, 6 says that we are to do The will of God. You know what that says to me? The will of God is not some type of mysterious puzzle that I've got to have some type of secret code in order to decipher and figure out exactly what it is that God wants me to do. You know what God wants me to do? What he said in the Bible he wants me to do. You know what God's will for your life is? That you live in a way that pleases him. You know how you can find out what pleases him? Open the book that he wrote. Come to church and have a pastor who opens the book that he wrote so we can know and understand and do the will of God. And here's here's the statement in our passage. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. That's your body, 2 Corinthians 4. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, and here's our word, but unto holiness. You know, God's will for your life is that you be sanctified, set apart, different from the world. You know what God's will for your life is? That you live a clean life and a holy life and a pure life. That you don't get all wrapped up in the defilement of the, of the crooked and perverse nation among whom we are to shine as lights in the world. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. God gives one very specific sin as an illustration of what he wants us to stay away from. The truth from God's word is that he created and he instituted marriage, performed the first marriage ceremony there in the Garden of Eden. By the way, one man, one woman that God could join together for the purpose of being fruitful and multiplying and replenishing the earth, and there's only one way that that works. And so we put a man and a woman together in a lifelong relationship, and then inside that boundary, inside that relationship, inside the bonds of holy matrimony, God created a special physical relationship for that man and for that woman to enjoy so that they could fill the earth and so that they could be one together and so that they could be knit together in body and in soul. And the devil is such a master at taking the wonderful, beautiful, incredible things that God makes and twisting and perverting them. And instead of a source of joy and blessing like God intends, it becomes a source of heartache and pain, and fornication is the number one sin in your country today. 
there's this big there's this big hubbub about the abortion issue. There would be no abortion issue if there weren't rampant fornication. There would be no abortion issue if people were not slaves to their lusts. There'd be no abortion issue if this nation was not worshiping the idol of immorality. The TV shows about fornication. The movies, it's about fornication. The songs, about fornication. Everything people are listening to and watching and talking about, it's, it's about people who aren't married and aren't in that relationship that God created and that God designed, taking what God established outside of the box that he put it in, said, here, open it on your wedding night. But God's will is that his people would be clean and would be holy and would abstain from fornication. The word's mentioned 32 times in the New Testament. Over and over throughout your Bible, God will give a list of sins that the believer is to avoid or a list of sins that that are the outworking of the flesh. And, And at the top of every one of those lists is this sin right here. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. No, 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 no. Sorry, Ephesians 6. Hebrews 13 and Ephesians 6. Look there first. Hebrews 13 and Ephesians chapter 6. God is really serious. God is really serious about this commandment. Hebrews 13 and Ephesians chapter number 6. Look at Ephesians 6 first of all. Ephesians 6, verse number 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's mom and dad's favorite verse. Verse number 2, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. The first commandment with promise. This is interesting. In the Old Testament... When God gave the law to the nation of Israel, there is a sense in which all of the commandments were with promise. People get this idea somehow that the Old Testament people got saved by keeping the law. That's never what God told them would be the outcome if they kept the law. God said, if you will keep this law, I will let you live in the land that I promised to your fathers. I will let you enjoy long life and peace and safety and prosperity right here in Canaan, Palestine, the promised land. You will get to stay alive. But the Holy Spirit took that out of the Old Testament and transplanted it into the New Testament and said, this is still true today. There is a promise that is attached to this one commandment, a promise of blessing, if you will Honor your mom and honor your dad. I will give you long life on the earth. There's a promise attached to the commandment, and and, and it's a blessing. And we ought to pay attention to that and try to get in on that promise. Now look at Hebrews 13. Similar but different. Hebrews 13, verse number 4. Hebrews 13, verse number 4, the Bible says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. It's not dirty what we're talking about. We're talking about it in the right context, the right way. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, look at this, God will judge. Here's another commandment in your Bible that is with promise. It's just not a promise of blessing. It's a promise of judgment. Not every commandment that God gave you in the New Testament has this attached to it. If you do that, it is going to hurt you. God's not going to let you get away with it. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I told you to mark it. We'll turn back and forth. 1 Thessalonians 4. Notice how that lines up with this statement. Verse 6. That no man go beyond to fraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. 
as we have forewarned you and testified. So in verse 4, God wants us to know how to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor. In verse number 1, God wants us to know how we ought to walk and to please God. You see that? How to walk and please God, verse 1. How to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. That's the purpose of of the commandments God gave us in verse 2. That's the purpose of the preachers that God gave us in verse 1, to teach us how to please the Lord, to teach us how to be pure, to teach us how to live holy, to teach us how to do the will of God, and that is to abstain from fornication. And, and God gave us a verse. He shows us how we can do that. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. First Corinthians 6 and verse 18, the Bible says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. There's that promise again. It's going to hurt you. And because it is going to hurt you, God said, run away from it. Get as far as you can, as fast as you can, not as close as you can, without falling over the edge. Flee fornication. Think about it this way. In Ephesians 5.18, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine. It is a sin to get drunk. Very clearly from the Bible. I believe it's a sin... To taste a drop. There are a lot of people who don't think it's sin to taste a drop. Everybody agrees, sin to get drunk. Right? There is one way I can 100% guarantee, foolproof, you will never get drunk. One thing you can do, this is how to never commit that sin. Don't take the first drink. Never let a drop of alcohol touch your lips. And I can promise you, with no hesitation or reservation, that if you'll never take, touch a drop, you'll never get drunk. You'll never know the heartache and the pain that comes from the stupid things you'll do if you do get drunk. The crimes that you'll commit because you're under the power and influence of that substance that's controlling your body. If you don't want to get drunk, don't touch alcohol. Proverbs puts it this way, look not upon the wine when it is red. Yes, sir. Solve every problem with that stuff. Okay? So you don't want to commit fornication because that's a sin. All right? God told you how to do that. Chapter 7, verse 1, may be the most unpopular verses in the New Testament. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 7 Verse number one, the Bible says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That'll do it. Yes, if your first kiss is the one at the end of the ceremony in front of God and witnesses, that'll pretty much take care of the fornication problem. Yes, You can have that really awkward experience at the end of exchanging your vows because you've never done this before and you don't know how to do it. And the first time you do it, it's in front of all these people watching you. And the kids covering their eyes. The boys, the girls are, well, it just depends. They're all different. Never mind. <laughs> right? That would, that, that would solve the problem. How can I abstain from fornication? Keep your hands off each other. How can I abstain from fornication? Don't be alone. With somebody of the opposite, with somebody you're not married to. Stop acting like you're married until you're married. Don't act like you belong to each other until there's a ring on your finger and you really do belong to each other. Flee. Don't, don't get close. Stay as far away as possible. 
Now concerning the things wherever you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to the wife due benevolence, likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power. Now the unpopular verses were verses 1 and 2. Verses 3 through 5 are very popular. The wife hath not power, I'm not going to say anything else about that. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. So here, here's what it is. Not only don't act like you're married before you are married, if you are married, go ahead and act like it. God said avoid fornication, and here's how you can do it. Because he did create the relationship, and it is a wonderful and good thing to be enjoyed in this box. So get in the box and enjoy it there. Leave everything else alone. Why? Because it's God's will. Why? Because it pleases him. Do you really want to please God? Well, then do things his way. And he very clearly shows us his way in his word. And he told people to get up and tell you about it. Even though it gets a little bit awkward. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 4. Look back there. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse number 7. First Thessalonians 4, 7. For God hath not called us into uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. Isn't that a great verse? Compare it with 2.13. When you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. Okay, so if a preacher gets up and tells you what the Bible says... And you get mad at him for it. Your problem's not with him. It's with the God that wrote the book. If you despise God's commandments, the problem is not the preacher. The problem you have is with the Lord. I'd be real careful having problems with the Lord. I know how that one's going to turn out. He that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us, His Holy Spirit. God really likes holiness. God dwells in a holy place wherever God is. Holiness permeates the area. You're not going to get into his presence, Hebrews 12, without holiness. So if you despise holiness, if you have a bad attitude towards commandments, your problem's with the Lord who loves holiness. It's really interesting at the end of verse 8. Look at the capitalization. But God, who hath also given unto us his holy, lowercase h, spirit, uppercase s. This is really interesting. Ninety times in the Bible, the Holy Ghost, capital H, capital G, is referenced. We don't use that term very often because we're not charismatics, but the Bible uses it a lot. Ninety times it says Holy Ghost. You know how many times the Bible uses Holy Spirit with a capital H and a capital S? Once. What does that mean? I'm not sure. (laughs) But it's interesting. There are five times that we have Holy Spirit, lowercase h, capital S, emphasizing the fact that God who is a spirit is holy and loves holiness and wants his people to be holy and gave his people his, Ephesians 1 is this way, lowercase h, capital S, Holy Spirit, to seal them to the day of redemption and try to work some of that holiness in us and through us. God hath given us His Holy Spirit. So how can we please the Lord? Verses 1 through 8, we need to walk holy. 
How can we please the Lord? Verses 9 and 10. We need to walk in harmony. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. The same idea as verse number 1. There's always room for growth. There's always room for improvement. Hope you love God's people. You ought to love God's people. You should want to love God's people more than you do. You need to increase and abound. These believers in Thessalonica, we learned in, verse, in, in chapter 1, they were an example in their witness. We learned they were an example in their joy. And we learned here they were an example in their love. Their witness, that's their relationship to the lost. Their joy, that's their heart's relationship to God. And their love, that's their relationships with one another. And they set a great example in every area. Verses 11 and 12, we can please God by walking not only in holiness, not only in harmony, we please God by walking in honesty. Verse number 11 says, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So many things that we say so often in our vernacular come straight for the Word of God. How many times has someone told you, you need to mind your own business? That is Bible truth. God said you need to study that a while. You need to take lessons in that type of quiet. Yes, sir. Study to be quiet and to do your own business. Because I got a lot of room in my own life for this abounding more and more of verse 1. I got a lot of room in my own life for this abounding more and more in verse number 10. And even though I got this huge beam sticking out of my eye, what's really easy for me to see is that little moat you got in your eye and the areas where you need to increase and abound and grow and change. And God told me, stop worrying about everybody else and their problems till you get all yours fixed. That's what the Bible says. And God wanted a preacher to tell you that so you could learn how to please him. Proverbs has a lot to say about this. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Preacher, what does that mean? I don't know. Find a pit bull and try it. Let me know. <laughs> I've never seen an illustration of this, but I would like to be able to illustrate it when I'm preaching. So report back to me on that one. Now, come on. That's the illustration God gave for someone who doesn't mind their own business. You pass by and it's a strife that's not yours, but you get yourself in the middle of it. You're just grabbing a pit bull. It's not smart. That causes problems. That hurts you. God loves you. He didn't want you to hurt yourself. Proverbs 26, 20, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no talebearer, the strife ceaseth. We've, we've read a lot in the Bible recently about peace and unity and loving one another. You know what that takes? Well, that takes stop throwing logs on the fire. Let the thing die. <laughs> you know, just because something is true doesn't mean it has to be said. Just because a tale could be told doesn't mean that it ought to be told. Because if you don't have tail bearing, then you eliminate a lot of strife. And if you can eliminate strife, you can enjoy unity. It's a really good thing. God likes it. We ought to let Ephesians 4.29 be the rule for our speech. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Ask yourself that before you send the text. Is this going to help the person that I'm texting? Ask yourself that before you type the email. Now, if it helps you to type it and then delete it, go ahead. That might be a healthy practice. 
But before you hit send, that little paper airplane button, before you touch that, do the Ephesians 4.29 test. Is this going to help? Is this going to edify? Is this going to build up? Don't ask yourself if it's true. It might be true. Right? Let Psalm 141 verse 3 be our prayer. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Mm, it pleases God when we walk in honesty. That you study to be quiet and to do your own business. To work with your own hands as we commanded you. That, that's reiterated strongly in the second epistle. If any should not work, neither should he eat. Provide not for your own, you're worse than an infidel. Verse 12, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without. You know, it hurts the cause of Christ when people who wear Jesus safe shirts and pass out tracks and have bumper stickers on their car don't pay their bills. <laughs> We're supposed to have a good testimony. We're supposed to represent the Lord of glory. We're supposed to represent the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and said, I'll meet all your need according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you know what God wants you to do? Because he's coming again, that's where we're about to get in 1 Thessalonians 4. Oh, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. What should I do? Go to work, pay your bills. To work with your own hands, Ephesians 4.28. You know why you need to work? You know, you know why Christians need to have a good work ethic? Because God wants you to have enough money that you can give some away to further his work. That's God's will. That's what God wants. That's the way God set it up. Now it's going to take work. God's people ought not be populating the welfare roll. God's people shouldn't be the one taking other people's money to pay for their groceries and their light bill and their apartment. So, Amen. Amen. If you despise that, I'm just reading the Bible. Verse number 12, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have lack of nothing. Now verse 11 and 12 really go together. These people would not have the time they have for tail bearing if they were working with their hands to walk honestly toward them that are without. That was the problem addressed in 1 Timothy chapter 5. These widows, they were busybodies. They were going from, you know why? Because they were idle. You get in a lot less trouble. You can do a lot of things way more productive than Facebook. Right? Why, why do we get in the position where we start saying things we shouldn't and start going places? If we just busy ourselves doing what we're supposed to do instead, we'd have a lot less opportunity. Right? So that's verses 1 through 12, and that's what leads into verses 13 through 18. Let's read it as we close this evening. Just great verses in the Bible. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? Amen. Have you trusted that? Is that your hope? Yes, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What a hope is ours. What a hope we have. Any day that trumpet could sound, and if you're here and you're saved, you're going straight up to meet the Lord. And if you're already dead and you're saved, you're getting up out of that grave to go and be with the Lord. The dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain, I want to be that part, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, that, that return is what we call imminent means it could happen at any time. 
There are no signs that have to be fulfilled for Christ to come at the rapture. And the imminence of Christ's return is emphasized all throughout the New Testament. We're not going to take the time to run the references this evening, but it's emphasized here in 1 Thessalonians 4. But what interested me as I studied this passage is what does it have to do with the context? How did, how did God fit verses 1 through 12 and verses 13 to 18 in the same chapter? Why did he put those two together? Verse 13 starts, but I would not have you to be ignorant. That is what we call a correlating conjunction. That, that, that word that starts this new thought attaches what follows to what preceded it. It establishes a connection between verses 1 through 12 and verses 13 through 18, but what is that connection? And all that I can figure with the rest of the passages in the New Testament, again, that we'll not study this evening, is that the point in emphasizing the imminence of Christ's return is simply to remind us how we are to live in light of the fact that He is coming and it could be at any time. So Jesus Christ could come again. What should we do? Well, we already said it, verse 12, go to work. Pay your bills. Jesus Christ is coming. What should I do tomorrow? Verse 11, mind my own business. Jesus Christ is coming. How can I get ready? Verses 9 and 10. I need to learn to love others and demonstrate that love for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus Christ, oh, I can't wait for the rapture, Lord. What do you want me to do? Clean up your life. Be pure. Be clean. Be holy. Find a preacher who will tell you what God commanded so that you can learn to walk in a way that pleases God. If we'll respond that way, when Jesus comes again, we'll certainly be, be glad that we did. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for your word this evening and the instruction that it gives us. Help us to take heed to what you've written in your word. Thank you for the help that it gives us, the light that it is. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.